you know, I grew up from, you know, with BBSs and then dial-up internet, you know, AOL, CompuServe, all that. I watched it evolve pretty slowly, but I remember once upon a time you used to purchase from your internet service provider, you would get one IP address for each device inside of your house. So if you wanted to have three or four computers on the internet, you'd have to buy three or four MAC addresses. And this would cost you, you know, we're talking about $10 per IP address per device, that was pretty miserable. Um, at the time, I remember I was just DJing in a nightclub. I wasn't making a whole lot of money. So I said, you know, is there any way that we can cheat? And they go, no, because you'd have to go around and use the same MAC address on all the devices because the service provider remembers your MAC address. And this is where I started learning a little bit about networking and all just trying to save money, right? There was this concept called IP masquerading and you would take I got an old computer, a Deck Alpha from work, which was a pretty nice, it was a 3D animation machine, but I, I called it a server. Um, just because the amount of RAM and everything, I was able to throw Linux in it, and I was able to basically perform network address translation. So if you think about the devices in your home, your, you know, if you've got an IP-enabled thermostat, uh, we've got something called a Furbo, so my wife can check in on the dog and shoot at treats and talk to it. I absolutely am against this stuff, but at the same time, you got to keep everybody happy. So, you know, that stuff like that works its way into your house. Well, the way that we control what comes and goes is typically because with IP version 4, we have network address translation, which means you've got inside of your home RFC 1918 addresses, right? We've got those private addresses from the 10 address space, the 192, the 172.16, etc. Um, all that stuff is hidden. And if you want to allow the internet to discover all those devices, well, you have to build a policy. You've got to do port forwarding with you know, network address translation and maybe modify an access control list to allow those particular services to be discovered. That said, you know, we look for things like Nest thermostats, we look for things like brother printers, and we see hundreds of thousands of examples directly attached to the internet or with some type of port forwarding enabled. The reason that I want you guys to understand this is because when we start moving towards IP version 6, um, IP version 6 isn't that new. It's been standardized, it's been finished, roughly, I use air quotes when I say finished, for about 15 years now. And it's on by default in all operating systems. Windows, Linux, OS X, they're all doing it by default. So are your mobile devices. So the place that you're probably using IPv6 and you don't know it is whenever you attach to a cellular network. Verizon, LTE, AT&T, these are IPv6 many times. You can test by just going to Google and saying, what is my IPv6 address? Or you could actually look through your network settings and see if it's enabled and everything. Uh, the crazy thing about IPv6, you know, you're going from this 32-bit um, addressing system to a 128-bit addressing system. And if you've done binary before, you know, just doing subnetting, right? And we just look at the way that the bits work. Every time we add one bit, our space doubles. So if I said, you know what, IPv4 just doesn't have enough address space. 32 bits was 4.2 billion combinations. We burnt a lot of these using kind of these funny reserves. Um, we burnt a lot of them using private addressing, which actually allowed us to stretch a lot further than we would have originally got. But we said, you know what, 4.2 wasn't enough. Well, if we moved to a 33-bit addressing system, as funny as that sounds, it would have been 8.4 billion addresses. And that carries on. If we went to 34 bits, it would have been 16.8 billion addresses. So the fact that we moved to a 128 numbering system is saying we have room for all the devices you'll ever own. And this is intergalactic. You know, as uh, Elon makes friends with his space car out there in outer space, when we find alien galaxies and they need addressing, we're like, don't worry, we've got enough We've got enough addresses for those guys too, should we ever find the aliens. IPv6 is, you know, a whole different world. It's The number is actually 340 undecillion. If you put your calculator into, you know, um, scientific mode and do 2 to the 128th, you'll see the number. It's obscenely large. Um, the idea here, again, is that uh, there's unique IP addressing for everything. Well, one of the goals, there were a lot of people that had their hands in IPv6. One of them was actually the Department of Defense. And one of the rules 
and this was kind of interesting because I really like the idea of NAT. I like things not being directly connected to the internet and then only connecting as necessary. You know, ideally I don't want anything on the internet that doesn't have to be there. I'd like to use proxies and update servers and intermediate devices that are doing sanitization. But with IPv6, the DoD was pushing for no network address translation. There was actually an RFC that gave you private addresses for internal use and set up some NAT, and they worked to kill it, and another group worked to bring it back, which means you just find very kind of hit or miss support for doing translations with v6. Um, how does that affect us? Well, we started off the conversation today revisiting Shodan, right? Um, when we look at the way that Shodan worked, it automatically archived everything that was out there, the version of code that was running, the IP address, etc. Your IPv6 addresses are going to tie into geographic regions, whether you're in Asia, whether you're in Russia, whether you're in your North America, South America. They've got global blocks for allocated to different countries or regions. It's a situation where absolutely everything on the planet is directly connected to everything else on the planet. So from a security perspective, this is terrifying. With IP version 4, you are almost secure by default. Um, the way that our firewalls work in version 4 is typically that outbound connections are OK. Inbound connections are denied by default. And if you send an outbound connection, it's evaluated by something called a state table. And the state table says, hey, I saw port 1025 connect out to port 80. I'm going to elect port 80, talk back to port 1025. So he has very granular control of what's coming and going on a port by port basis. He maintains that state table. With IP version 6, there's none of that whatsoever. Everything absolutely talks unless you tell it not to. So this is basically connected by default with IPv6. You have to construct access control lists and deny what's not supposed to pass. Where with v4, it's a little bit different. So v6 sounds dangerous, right? The real danger is that it's 15 years old. I talk to 10 network people. I go, hey, how many of you guys are running IPv6? I bet you $10, all 10 of them say no. Or they're doing it a little bit in one area, not another. Um, if you start to look at people at service providers, AT&T, Comcast, sure, they're using it in limited capacities. A lot of times in cellular environments. But I go, do you have any idea of when you're rolling it out to customers? Most of them say no. When I talk to businesses, when I talk to municipalities, and I go, hey, do you have any plans to move to IPv6? And they go, oh, we kind of support it ish in some areas. I, but there's no, for most organizations, there's not a big goal in place because it's hard to justify the cost and effort. You know, when we take, take a look at the re return on investment, what do we get out of IPv6? It's not really any faster. It's not really any more secure. You use IPsec in the same way that you do with IP version 4. So what does it take in terms of costs? You've got to have different hardware that's capable of doing accelerated forwarding of IPv6 packets. So they've got to have different, what's called an ASIC, an application-specific integrated circuit, that allows you to move those packets through at lightning speed. Devices will say IPv6 supported, but it'll have a little asterisk there. And a lot of times that, that means it's happening in software, not happening with hardware acceleration. So we've got to wait till all of our hardware is in place. Um, how about backwards compatibility? Is v4 going anywhere? No, right? So you're doing dual stack, v4 and v6, which means if you've got to troubleshoot a network problem, you've got to figure out how is it communicating? Is it through IP version 4, IP version 6? Your load balancers are different. Your firewalls are different. Your ACLs are different. You're running two times the routing protocols a lot of times. You can do it all under one version. You can do OSPF version 3 everywhere and with v4 support. But that means every single device in your organization has to support the latest version of OSPF v3, which most people don't have that. So it puts us in kind of this funny spot where it's enabled on all the devices, but not necessarily everybody's using it but you'll try to use it. If you connect to a network and they offer you a v6 address, your computer, your smartphone will absolutely take that. And now you're on a different network. You've got different protocols in use. There's different ways to perform man in the middle attacks. There's different protocol attacks in v6, just like you have a protocol attack against IPv4. So 
I don't see IP version 4 going away before I retire in technology, which I don't think will be for 25 years. So, and maybe never, right? So if V4 is not going away anytime soon, what's happening with V6? It's slowly being turned on all around us, but a lot of people don't understand it. The downside, again, everything is attached. Things can be directly scanned. Um, the idea of software firewalls and access control lists on endpoints are going to become more and more important. But a lot of people are just ignoring it because they're like, ah, I've been hearing about it for 10 years and nobody's really using it yet. So from a security perspective, I think it's pretty interesting to learn IPv6. Um, offensively, it's a good way to take advantage of other people. They don't understand it. It's people that are implementing it have a loose understanding of it many times. So you can manipulate their configurations more easily without being detected. Uh, operating systems prefer v6 to v4. So if you just join a public network, and I'm on the network, and I do v6 advertisements, you'll take them, and you'll prefer to use my v6 gateway opposed to the IPv4 gateway. So again, from an offensive perspective, it's very interesting to learn. It's extremely effective. And from a defender's perspective, you know, rule one of security, if we're not using it, turn it off, right? So you could do this with group policy. You could turn all the devices in the organization off in terms of their IPv6 capabilities. Why? Makes it simpler. Why run two protocols if you can get away with one? And I would continue doing that until they made me, absolutely forced me to turn on v6. They said there's no other way to get to this website than get there through v6. And there's still ways to get there. Um, but you know, we could, we could go a long way without turning this on. And really, once we do turn it on, it just changes network discovery, network communication completely from what we had with V4.